With permission from Scholastic, I will be reading chapter 11 from the City of Ember. Your reading strategy for this chapter is about connections, okay? So I want you to try to find three connections um, while you're listening to this chapter. First, a connection to another text. Um, so that would be um, something about this book that reminds you about something else that you've read, whether it was a news article or another book. Um, you want to try to find a text to text connection. The second connection that I'm looking for is something in this chapter that reminds you of something from your own life. Okay, and then the third connection that we're looking for is one to the world. So maybe something about this reminds you of something that you heard on the news or saw on social media like Instagram or just something else from real life that like happened to a family member or just kind of anyone else really, okay? So three connections, text to text, text to self, and text to the world. So something that reminds you of something that you've read yourself and something else in the world, whether it's someone else or something else, okay? Looking for connections in this chapter. Chapter 11, Lizzie's Groceries. Lena spent all day, that all that day in Mrs. Murdo's house, which was just like theirs, only neater. There was one couch and one fat chair covered in fuzzy striped material and one big table. Only Mrs. Murdo's table wasn't wobbly like theirs. On the table was a basket and in the basket, were three turnips, each of them lavender on one end and white on the other. Mrs. Murdo must have put them there, Lena thought, not just because she was going to have them for dinner, but also because they were beautiful. Lena sat sideways on the couch with her legs stretched out, and Mrs. Murdo covered her with a soft gray-green blanket. This will keep you warm, she said, tucking it around Lena's legs. Lena didn't really feel cold, but she did feel sad which was in a way the same. The blanket felt good, like someone holding her. Mrs. Murdo gave Poppy a long purple scarf to play with, and made a creamy mushroom soup with potatoes, and all day Lena stayed there, snuggled under the blanket. She thought about her grandmother, who had had a long and mostly cheerful life. She cried some and fell asleep. She woke up and played with Poppy. The day had a strange but comforting feel to it, like a rest between the end of one time and the beginning of another. On the morning of the next day, Lena got up and got ready to go to work. Mrs. Murdo gave her the beet tea and spinach hash for breakfast. The singing's coming up soon, she remarked to Lena as they ate. Do you know your part? Yes, said Lena. I remember it pretty well from last year. I rather like the singing, said Mrs. Murdo. I love it, said Lena. I think it's my favorite day of the year. Once a year, the people of the city came together to sing the three great songs of Ember. Just thinking of it made Lena feel better. She finished her breakfast and put on her red jacket. Don't worry about Poppy, I'll take care of her, said Mrs. Murdo as Lena headed out the door. When you come back this evening, we'll talk about how to proceed. Proceed, said Lena. Well, you can't live by yourselves, just the two of you, can you? We can't? Certainly not, said Mrs. Murdo sternly. Who's to take care of Poppy while you're off delivering the messages? You must move in here with me. I have an empty bedroom, after all, and quite a nice one. Come and look. She opened the door at the far end of the living room, and Lena peeked in. She had never seen such a beautiful, cozy room. There was a big, lumpy bed covered with a faded blue blanket, and at its head, four plump pillows. Next to the bed was a chest of drawers with drawer handles shaped like teardrops and a mirror attached to the top. The carpets on the floor were all different shades of blue and green, and in the corner was a sturdy square table and a chair with a back like, la like a ladder. This will be your room, said Mrs. Murdo. Yours and Poppy's. You'll have to share the bed, but it's big enough. It's lovely, said Lena. You're so kind, Mrs. Murdo. Well, said Mrs. Murdo briskly, it's just common sense. You need a place. I have one. You go on now, and I'll see you this evening. Three days had passed since Lena and Dune had seen the man in the pipeworks, and there hadn't been any special announcements. So if that man had discovered a way out of Ember, he was keeping the news to himself. Lena couldn't understand why. As Lena ran through the city with her messages on her first day back at work, it seemed to her that the mood of the people was even gloomier than before. There were long, silent lines at the market, 
and knots of people gathered in the squares talking in low voices. Many shops more each day, it seemed, just laid signs in their windows saying closed or open Monday and Tuesday only. Monday and Tuesday only. Every now and then the lights flickered and people stopped and looked up in fright. When the lights flickering, I'm going to start that part over. Many shops more each day, it seemed, displayed signs in their windows saying closed or open Monday and Tuesday only. Every now and then the lights flickered and people stopped and looked up in fright. When the flickering ended and the lights stayed lit, people just took a breath and walked on. Lena delivered her messages as usual, but inside she felt strange. Everywhere she ran, she heard the same words like a drumbeat in her mind. Alone in the world, alone in the world. Wasn't exactly true. She had Poppy, she had friends, and she had Mrs. Murdo, who was somewhere between a friend and a relative, but she felt as if she had suddenly gotten older in the last three days. She was a sort of mother herself now. What happened to Poppy was more or less up to her. As the day went on, she stopped thinking alone in the world and began thinking about her new life at Mrs. Murdo's. She thought about the blue-green room and planned how she would arrange her, arrange her pictures on the wall. The one she'd drawn with her blue pencil would look especially nice because it would match the color of the rugs. She, she could bring her pillows from home and add them to the ones on the bed. And then she'd have six all together. And maybe she could find some old blue dresses or shirts and make pillow covers for them. The blue green room, the orderly apartment, the meals cooked, the blankets tucked in cozily at night. All this gave her a feeling of comfort, almost luxury. She was grateful for Mrs. Murdo's kindness. I'm not yet ready to be alone in the world, she thought. Late that afternoon, Lena was given a message to take Lampling Street. She delivered the message and as she was coming back out onto the street, caught sight of Lizzie coming out of the door of the supply depot. Her orange hair was unmistakable. Lizzie, Lena called out. Lizzie must not have heard her. She kept on going. Lena called again. Lizzie, wait. This time it was clear that Lizzie had heard, but instead of stopping, she walked faster. What's the matter with her, Lena wondered. She ran after her and grabbed the back of her coat. Lizzie, it's me. Lizzie stopped and turned around. Oh, she said. Her face was flushed. It's you. Hi. I, I thought it was. I didn't realize it was you. She smiled brightly, but there was a, a distracted look in her eyes. I was just going home, she said. Her arms were wrapped around a small bulging sack. I'll walk with you, said Lena. Oh, said Lizzie. Oh, good. But she didn't look pleased. Lizzie, something sad has happened, Lena said. My grandmother died. Lizzie gave her a sideways glance, but she didn't stop walking. That's too bad, she said absently. Poor you. What was wrong with her? Lizzie was ordinarily so interested in other people's misfortunes. She could be sincerely sympathetic, too, but that's when she wasn't wrapped up in her own troubles. Lena changed the subject. What's in the sack? she asked. Oh, just some groceries, said Lizzie. I stopped at the market after work. You did? Lena was confused. She had seen Lizzie not two minutes ago leaving the storeroom. Lizzie didn't answer. She began walking and talking quite fast. It was so busy at work today. Work is so hard, isn't it, Lena? I think work is much harder than school and not as interesting. You do the same thing every day. I get so tired. Uh, don't you running around all day? Lena started to say that she liked running and hardly ever got tired, but Lizzie didn't wait for her to answer. Oh, well, at least there are some good things about it. Guess what, Lena? I have a boyfriend. I met him at work. He really likes me. He says my hair is the exact color of a red hot burner on a stove. Lena laughed. It's true, Lizzie, she said. You look like your head is on fire. Lizzie laughed too and lifted one hand to fluff her hair. She puckered her lips and fluttered her lashes. He says I'm as beautiful as a red tomato. They were crossing Torque Square now. It was crowded in the square. People had just left work and were lining up at the shops and hurrying along with packages. A cluster of children sat on the pavement, playing some sort of game. Who is this boyfriend? asked Lena. But just at that moment, Lizzie tripped. She'd been strutting along, being beautiful, not paying attention to her feet. And at the edge, her shoe caught on an uneven place in the pavement. She staggered and fell. And as she fell, she lost her grip on the sack. It hit the ground and toppled sideways, and some cans spilled out. 
They rolled in all different directions. Lena reached for Lizzie's arm. Did you hurt yourself? She asked. But Lizzie went scrambling after the cans so quickly it was clear she wasn't hurt. Wanting to help, Lena went after the cans too. Two had rolled under a bench. Another was going toward the children, who were on their feet now, watching Lizzie's wild spider-like motions. Lena picked up the cans under the bench. For one second, her breath stopped. One of them was a can of peaches. Peaches. It said right on it, and there was a picture of a yellow globe. No one she knew had seen a can of peaches in years. She looked at the other one. It was just as amazing. Cream corn, it said. Lena remembered having cream corn once as a thrilling treat when she was five years old. There was a shout. <laughs> Sorry, my dogs heard a car door. Let's continue. There was a shout. There was a shout. She looked up. One of the children had picked up a can. Look at this, he cried, and the other children gathered around him. Applesauce, he said, and the children murmured. Applesauce, applesauce, as if they had never heard the word before. Lizzie was on her feet. She had all the cans except for the two in Lena's hand and the one the child had picked up. She stood there for a moment, her eyes flicking back and forth from Lena to the children. Then she smiled, a bright, fake-looking smile. Thanks for helping me, she said. I found these on a back shelf at the market. What a surprise, huh? You can keep those. She waved the back of her hand at the children, waved again at Lena, and then took off, holding the sack by its neck so it hung beside her and banged against her legs. Lena didn't follow her. She walked home thinking about Lizzie's sack of cans. You simply did not find cans of peaches and applesauce and cream corn on the back shelves of markets. Lizzie was lying. And if the cans hadn't come from the market, then where had they come from? There was only one answer. They had come from the storerooms. Somehow, Lizzie had gotten them because she worked in the storeroom office. She paid for them? How much? Or had she taken them without paying? Mrs. Murdo had cooked dinner of beet and bean stew for dinner that night. When Lena showed her the two cans, she gasped in astonishment. Where did you get these? She asked. From a friend, said Lena. And where did your friend get them? Lena shrugged. I don't know. Mrs. Murdo frowned slightly, but didn't ask any more questions. She opened the cans and they had a feast. Cream corn with their stew and peaches for dessert. It was the best meal Lena had had in a very long time. But her enjoyment of it was tainted just a little by the question of where it had come from. The next morning, Lena headed for Broad Street. Before she started delivering messages today, she was going to have to, to have a talk with Lizzie. She spied her half a block from the storeroom office. She was sauntering along, looking in shop windows. A long green scarf was round around her neck. Lena ran up swiftly behind her. Lizzie, she said. Lizzie whirled around. When she saw Lena, she flinched. She didn't say anything, just turned around and kept walking. Lena caught hold of one end of the green scarf and jerked Lizzie to a halt. Lizzie, she said, stop. What for? Lizzie said. I'm going to work. She tried to pull away but didn't get far because Lena had a firm grip on her scarf. Lena spoke in a low voice. There were people all around them. A couple of old men leaning against a wall, a group of chattering children just ahead, workers going towards the storerooms, and she didn't want to be overheard. You have to tell me where you got those cans, she said. I told you, I found them on a back shelf at the market. Let go of my scarf. Lizzie tried to wrench her scarf out of Lena's grip, grip, but Lena held on. You didn't, Lena said. You know market would just forget about things like that. Tell me the truth. She gave a yank on the end of the scarf. Stop it. Lizzie reached out and grabbed a handful of Lena's hair. Lena yelped and pulled harder on the scarf, and the two of them scuffled, snatching at each other's hair and coats. They knocked against a woman who snapped at them angrily. And finally, they toppled over, sitting down hard on the pavement. Lena was the first one to laugh. It was so much like they, what, what they used to do for fun, chasing each other and screaming with laughter. Now here they were again, nearly grown girls, sitting in a heap on the pavement. After a moment, Lizzie laughed too. You dope, she said. All right, I'll tell you. I sort of wanted to anyways. Le Lizzie leaned forward with her elbows on her knees and lowered her voice. 
Well, it's this, she said. There's a storeroom worker named Looper. He's a carrier. Do you know him? He has two classes ahead of, he was two classes ahead of us. Looper Winley. I know who he is, said Lena. I took a message for him on my first day of work. Tall, with a long, skinny neck. Big teeth, funny looking. Lizzie looked hurt. Well, I wouldn't describe him that way. I think he's handsome. Lena shrugged. Okay, go on. Looper explores the storerooms. He goes into every room that isn't locked. He knows what the true situation is, Lena. He's not like most workers who just plod along doing their jobs and then go home. He wants to find things out. And what has he found out? Lena asked. He's found out that there's still a little bit left of some rare things, but just a few things in rooms here and there that have been forgotten. You know, Lena, there are so many rooms down there. Some of them, way out at the edges, are marked empty in the ledger book, and so no one ever goes there anymore. But Looper found out that they're not all empty. So he's been taking things. Just a few things, and not that often. And he's giving some to you. Yes, because he likes me. Lizzie smiled a little smile and hugged her arms together. I see, Lena thought. She feels that way about Looper. But Looper's stealing, said Lena. And Lizzie, he isn't just stealing things for you. He has a store. He steals things and sells them for huge prices. He does not, said Lizzie. But she looked worried. He does. I know because I bought something from him just a few weeks ago. He's a whole box of colored pencils. Lizzie scowled. He never gave me any colored pencils. He shouldn't be giving you things anyways or, or selling things. Don't you think everyone should know about the food he found? No, Lizzie cried. Because listen, there's only one can of peaches left. Only one person gets to have it, right? So why should everyone know? They just end up fighting over it. What good would that be? Lizzie reached out and put a hand on Lena's knee. Listen, she said. I'll ask Looper to find good stuff for you, too. I know he will if I ask him. Before she had time to think, Lena heard herself saying, What kind of good stuff? Lizzie's eyes gleamed. There's two packages of colored paper, he told me, and some cough medicine, and there's three pairs of girls' shoes. It was a treasure. Colored paper. Cough medicine to cure sickness and shoes. She hadn't had new ones for almost two years. Lena's heart raced. What Lizzie said was true. If everyone knew there were still a few wonderful things in the storerooms, people would fight each other trying to get to them. But what if no one knew? What difference would it make if she had the colored paper or the shoes? She suddenly wanted those things so badly she felt weak. A picture arose in her mind's eye. The shelves at Mrs. Murdo's house stocked with good things and the three of them happier and safer than other people. Lizzie leaned closer and lowered her voice. Looper found a can of pineapple. I was going to split it with him, but I'll give you a bite if you promise not to tell. Pineapple, that delectable, long-lasting thing that her grandmother had told her about. Was there anything wrong with having a bite of it just to see what it was like? I've already tasted peaches, applesauce and a thing called fruit cocktail said lizzie and prunes and cream corn and cranberry sauce and asparagus all that lena was astonished then there's a lot of special things like that still no said lizzie not at all in fact not a lot we finished all of those you and looper lizzie nodded smiling smugly Looper says it's all going to be gone soon anyways. Why not live as well as we can right now? But Lizzie, why should you get all of that? Why you and not other people? Because we found it. Because we, we get it. I don't think that's very fair, said Lena. Lizzie spoke as if she were talking to a not very bright child. You can have some too. That's what I'm telling you. There are still a few good things left. But that wasn't the unfairness Lena was thinking of. It was just that two people were getting things that everyone would, would have wanted. She couldn't think how it would have been done. You couldn't divide a can of applesauce evenly among all the people in the city. Still, something was wrong with grabbing the good things 
just because you could. It seemed not only unfair to everyone else, but bad for the person who was doing it somehow. She remembered the hunger she'd felt when Looper showed her the colored pencils. It wasn't a pleasant feeling. She didn't want to want things that way. She stood up. I don't want anything from Looper. Lizzie shrugged. Okay, she said. But there was a look of dismay on her small, pale face. Too bad for you. Thanks anyway, said Lena, and she set off across Torque Square, walking fast at first and then breaking into a run. End of chapter 11.